Romans 13, there's only 14 verses tonight. We're going to spend some time here on the first part of it because uh, it seems like the last few years uh, there was a lot of stuff in the news with the protest and defund the police and all this stuff that I keep thinking of this, these verses from Romans 13, which uh, begins with the first verse, 13, 1. Let every soul, the second word is what? Let most souls, no, let every soul, <laughs> that's everybody, be subject to the higher powers. And this is the governing authorities that's set up by God. For, for there's no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. In other words, as long as we're living down here in this age, it's a sinful age. People are, are human beings, and human beings are sinful, and we've got to have checks to that. We've got to have policemen. We've got to have jails. We've got to, there's got to be something that serves as a check to, to evil. Even in the, the first century, Jesus told Pontius Pilate, said, the only power you've got, the only reason you're in that position is because God's given you that power. He was set up as one of the powers to be. That don't mean the powers to be are always good. That's just a good example of that. But the powers that be are, are the governing body is something that God puts in control down here. So <clears throat> otherwise it'd be what? Anarchy. Only a few idiots in the world want anarchy. There is a few. <laughs> Whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves judgment or damnation. Now, all this stuff we've seen on the news, you know, George Floyd, everybody else, Whatever happened in the excess and the wrong, it, it, almost every one of them has one thing in common. People resist arrest. And I've said this over the years in the newsletter, and I'll say it over and over again. I said, parents, you've got to teach your kids that if the policeman tries to stop you or anything, the thing to do is to stop. The moment that you try to resist or run, that's never going to end well. And even if you know that you didn't do anything wrong, still, if the policeman tries to stop you, you stop. Go downtown with them and get it straightened out later. But if you take off running or trying to resist or fight or anything, that's always going to end badly. And you can circle that in verse 2 two times. It's about resisting. Don't resist the powers that be. Because even if they're wrong, you can go through the courts and get things straightened out. But in the heat of the moment, it's not going to end good. You could get shot or you could get beat or you could get anything. I'm not saying those things are all right either, but just it, it, a lot of things can be avoided if people just do not resist. And here's kind of the thing, too, to teach the kids. For the rulers are not a terror... To good works. If you ain't doing something wrong, you don't have to walk around scared of the policeman all the time. And that's the difference in the cultures that I see too. People that you know I've known come right through this church. They live in a different culture, and it's it's hard for us to relate and hard for them to relate. There's a lot of them that you know prayed the sinner's prayer and I've baptized, and they just can't get out of that culture. And I'm going to start telling people this, you know, like. Hey, you cannot stay in that culture in some of these places that people are living because crime is just a part of the culture, and, and that's just how it is. And, and they don't think like that, that I shouldn't do this. They think i got to do it, and then I'll get caught. And, and that, that is going to end bad every time. So here's, I've thought a lot about this. I think a lot when I'm riding on the lawnmower or something, how to, how to you know, look back over the years and things I could have done differently. It's like, hey, if somebody gets saved and they're in some of these, these messes of these neighborhoods around here, there, there's a way out, and it ain't easy. And I'll help you to get out. And I'll help you to get out by, by counseling and talk like, hey, it might be tough. You might have to give up your lottery tickets and your beer and your cell phone and all these other things you have. And instead of spending money on that, you got to put it up until you can pack your out of way and make a down payment to get out of that mess. Because once you get in that mess, it's, it's like you're trying to live in that, and it's just a bad, bad culture. 
and and that ain't just blacks it's whites I, I, it's in all cultures when you get it. it's it's in all cities it's right here in the shadow of the church this culture that that's around here people just don't think that but and and i've seen some of their kids even at church if a policeman comes by or something you know that's like they're scared it's the cops that's that culture see your kids shouldn't be thinking that way. You ought to teach your kids that the policeman's your friend. If you're ever in trouble, go to the policeman because they're not a terror to good works, but to the evil, they are a terror. But when, when you hear that, it's usually when we have a kid, it's because mom and daddy's doing something wrong. And it's, you're hearing it from the kids. <clears throat> Rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and you'll have praise of the same. You'll be rewarded for doing the right thing, but if you're doing the wrong thing, yeah, you'll be afraid. <laughs> for he's the minister of God to thee for good. That policeman on the corner, he's a, he's a servant of God. Whether he knows it or not, he's fulfilling a, a position that, that's doing God's work. But if you do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain to make that contemporary. That gun on his hip is there for a reason. <laughs> he beareth not the sword in vain. He's the minister or the servant of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him which does evil. Wherefore, you must needs be subject to the powers that be. We're talking about the governing bodies. Not only for wrath or to stay out of trouble, but for your conscience sake. Now, the problem we live in today, there's a lot of people ain't got no conscience. Because we're living in that time that Paul prophesied about in his letter to Timothy and said in the last days that there'll be people whose conscience has been seared with a hot iron. They can do anything, not have any remorse out of it. For this cause pay you tribute also. In other words, that these governing bodies, they have to be financed, and that's what, what your tax money's doing. And, and really, it's, they're God's servants, God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Uh, even Jesus said that, right? Remember, they tried to trick Jesus up, said, uh, said should we pay our taxes or should we, we give to the temple? He said, you render unto Caesar, that's Caesar was the government, the things that are Caesar's. Then you render unto God the things that are God's. One does not supplant the other one. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute, that's another word for taxes, to whom tributes due, custom to whom custom, fear to fear, honor unto whom honor. Now, before we leave these seven verses here in this conglomerate, I'm going to say this. You obey the government, there's laws. There's laws and laws are set up for good by the governing bodies. And, and God says that's one of the ways that he, he keeps things in check in this world through the governing bodies. Now, is there ever a time that you wouldn't... There is a time. There's, there's something called civil disobedience. We're not living there yet, but it could be very much in the near future. And there's plenty of biblical precedents that, hey, if the government says that you're supposed to do something that is against God's law, then you serve God, not the government. You say the government is wrong. It's all through the Bible like that. Um, now, we're not there yet. Now, we're, in the, we're living in the place where government allows sin to take place without any consequences whether it's gay marriage or whether it's abortions it may be legal but the Christians just say well that's what the world's doing but we can't participate in that that's where we're at and we can live like that but if it ever, what if it ever become a law like the China had I think China finally has changed, I think I saw recently, but for years in China, if a family had two kids and, and there was another pregnancy, that was an automatic abortion. What do you do in that case? Well, the government says you can't have that third one. You have got to go and abort that baby. Then you have to do like the apostles said in the book of Acts. We've got to obey God and not men. God says that's wrong. don't matter if the government says to do it or not. You know, somebody did that very thing in the Bible. Somebody by the name of Amram and Jochebed, Moses' parents. Because the government in their day said for them Hebrews that there's getting to be too many of them over there, so I want you to take them babies and throw them in the Nile River and let the crocodiles eat them up. 
And Amram and Jochebed, they hid Moses for all those years or all those months until they couldn't anymore. And then they put him in that ark of bulrushes and floated him down there where Pharaoh's daughter was taking a bath. You know, and every, God worked out in the details and everything. But that was practicing civil disobedience. They, they couldn't do what their government was telling them to do. They had to do what their God had, had told them, them to do. Other instances, you've been keeping up on Sunday nights, studying through the book of Daniel. Daniel is full of people who practice civil disobedience. Their, their government was Babylon. And we start out with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the king puts that law into place that says when you hear all the music play, you got to bow down and worship his statue. And they said, we're Hebrews, we can't do that. Well, the law says if anybody don't do it, the law says you're, they're, they're going to be thrown in prison. They're going to be thrown in a burning, hot, fiery furnace. And I love what they said. They said, well, said our God is able to deliver us. And I'm paraphrasing. They said, but if he don't, we're still winners. <laughs> Either way. He did deliver them because there's a fourth man walking in the fire. I think there's the Lord Jesus Christ. The old king looked in there and said, I see a fourth man walking in there, and he looks like the son of God. And then you flip on a few chapters later, and there's old Daniel. They passed another law. And see, they're, they, it's, it, jealousy causes a lot of problems, don't it, all through the Bible and all through life. And, and here's uh, Daniel's been raised up through the government till he's like vice president. And he's been originally captured, one of them Jewish boys from down there, and years went on. He's like vice president of, of the place. And the other politicians say they was getting a little jealous. And they said, we're going to get him. We're going to get. We're gonna dig up some dirt on old Daniel. And they said, what can we find on him? And everybody knew. So the, they got their heads together and said, if we get anything on Daniel, it's going to be on some religious thing because you know how, he, how religious he is. So they said, and they went and convinced the king. And they said, yeah, king, we believe, uh, we, want to, we, go, we want to honor you. So we want you to pass a law that can't be changed and said uh, that uh, no man for, I think it's a month, X number of days, said for nobody can pray to any other God or ask any petition of anybody but you because you're going to be number one. And he said, that sounds good. No king signed that in the law and it couldn't be changed. Though Daniel, they knew see, they had him because they knew what he did every morning and every day and afternoon and every evening, morning, noon, and evening, breakfast, lunch, and supper. Old Daniel would go out on his balcony and he'd open them doors up and he'd face Jerusalem. It's the way the Jews used to pray when they was away from the temple. You know, they'd face, they'd face where the temple would be in Jerusalem. So three times a day, that was Daniel's habit. He didn't do something new when they passed the law. He just said, I'm going to keep doing what I've always done. He said, I'm going to go out and I'm going to pray morning, noon, and evening. And they was waiting on him out there. That's what got him thrown in the lion's den, wasn't it? <laughs> now, God preserved him through that. Now, there, there's, there's messages for you and I that they, we may be called upon someday to practice civil disobedience as Christians, but we also know, well, you've got to be ready. You've got to be ready to suffer suffer whatever the consequences in this world might be. And, and kind of like the Hebrew children, you know, God might preserve us and he might not. It's up to him, but we're winners either way because you're a loser if you cave to the authorities and disobey God. As the apostle said, when you come into that kind of conflict, we have got to obey God and not men. We're not there yet, but I, I think we're seeing the, the tip of the iceberg sometimes. Uh, Mary and Joseph. The law was, all them babies under two years old, we're going to destroy them. We're going to kill them. Mary and Joseph fled into Egypt with Jesus, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Until that king died and, and, and they came back. So that, that's kind of, you know, that's all through the Bible for a reason, not just history. Because, hey, history repeats itself, and we may be in the same situation sometime, and you got to decide, am I going to practice my Christianity and serve God, or am I going to deny God and do something sinful that the government may be commanding me to do? There's a time when Christians might just have to say, I can't participate in that anymore, and God's law always overrules man's law. Verse 7, I think, uh, verse 8 is where we got to. Oh, no man anything. Oh, how literal you can take this. Could be an admonition against indebtedness too. 
But if you owe anybody anything, here's the only thing you got to owe everybody. Love one another. For he that loves another has fulfilled the law. Well, there's a lot of law in this Old Testament. The New Testament says, yeah, love, love uh, fulfills that law. Now, love is <laughs> love. Is love. <laughs> But love is not the warped up version sometimes that you get. A lot of what you're hearing today is like, if you say anything that might offend anybody, that's not loving. That's not biblical. You want to love people, but sometimes loving people involves, well, you got to warn people. If you love your kids and, and the little boys, I'm going to let my kids just do whatever they want. Or that ain't love, is it? A little boy three years old said, Mom, I'm going to go over there and play behind that log you're out camping. Daddy says, I saw a rattler over there, don't you? Go over there. Mom says, no, no, we love our kid. We're going to let him do what he wants. That ain't love, is it? So love warns people. We know that, hey, when, when, <laughs> but, but the world wants to take that and say, don't you judge me. <laughs> I'm loving you. <laughs> love one another. That's fulfilled the law. And then he's going to elaborate on this. For this, and then you find a whole list of the Ten Commandments in verse 9. For this, see if you can figure these out where they're at here. Thou shalt not commit adultery. I think that's number seven. Thou shalt not kill. I think that's number six. Thou shalt not steal. That's some there too. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Don't be lying. Thou shalt not covet or have that ungodly desire that leads to all these other sins of stealing. If there be any other commandment, is, is there any other commandment? He listed how many there? Let's count them. Adultery, murder, stealing, lying, and covetousness. That's five. So he listed the second table. The first table's generally thought to be four because the fourth one was extra wordy, remember, <laughs> about the Sabbath day. The first table is all the way about you, how, you, how you love God. The second table is all about how you love your neighbor. That's why that man in the New Testament asked Jesus, what's the greatest or the most important commandment? And Jesus says, the greatest commandment is this, to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. See, that takes care of the whole first table. And then Jesus added, and he said, and the second, or the second greatest, is love your neighbor as yourself. And if you love your neighbor as yourself, then you'll, it takes care of that next six. Now, I said there's five of the six on the second table listed. Which one's missing? Your mom and your dad, your parents. Love your parents, right? Honor your mother and your father. And, and uh, I think it's in here indirectly. If there's any other commandment, we just mentioned it, it's briefly comprehended in this saying, love your neighbor as yourself. Your parents are your closest neighbors. Ten. Love works no ill to his neighbor. It doesn't do harm to your neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling of the law. There's another place Paul says that the law can just be summed up in one word. Love. <laughs> the law of love. Love God and love your neighbor. And that knowing the time, that now it's high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. I don't, I don't know if, if Jesus is going to come back in our lifetime or not. I like to think he is, but I, I know this much, uh, that... He's closer to coming back than he was the day I got saved. That's just a fact, ain't it? And if he don't come back before we exit this world, then that's nearer than it was the day that we got saved. That's our full salvation when we enter, when we leave this world. The night's far spent. The day's at hand. It's near, he says. Let's therefore cast off the works of darkness like John I think we may do John's Gospel next. I look and I don't think we've done it in quite a number of years. It, and John's theme is darkness and light all the way through it. 
Paul does a lot with that too. Like the world's living in darkness, but the church is the light that's supposed to be shining in the darkness. Let's cast off the works of darkness. It means don't be like the dark world. And let us put on the armor of light. And here's some of the ways we do that. Well, honesty. That ought to be a trait, a character trait of Christians. Like, let's walk honestly, as in the day, not rioting and drunkenness, chamberling, wantonness, not striving. Not, don't just get out of that mess. <laughs> How do we do that, Lord? And he answers it in the next one. Well, the answer is you got to, I'm going to paraphrase the last verse before I read it. You got to live Christ like instead of living according to the flesh like. We all toting around flesh, and it all wants to, it all wants to get mad and get evil and get the upper hand. But if you're a Christian, you also inhabited by the spirit of God and there's where the battle comes in between the flesh and the spirit the spirit's will and the flesh is weak remember that he says but you gotta you gotta put on Christ you know you gotta, you gotta let Christ reign not let, let the flesh reign put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust of the flesh Lord we thank you for the command we pray that you'd help us to carry out the command by putting on Christ instead of just walking around as creatures of sinful flesh. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.